So um, the, uh, as I hope all of you know, the focus of the program is on automating the process of doing science. And that uh, has at least three pieces, three main pieces, which is the ability to automatically generate data. So that's robotics for doing scientific experiments. And then um, machine learning to build predictive models from the data that has been acquired so far and artificial intelligence to decide what experiments it would be good to do in order to improve the model that we have so far. So, and then we cycle around again. And so the idea is that whatever data we have so far, we use it to build a model, then we use that model to decide what experiments should be done next, and then we execute them. So that means we can have this be a closed loop uh, process. Um, and uh, you may be wondering if this, is, this kind of thing has been done. So the first example that we know of is um, a system that was built a number of years ago. Um, and it was a system that um, combined laboratory automation with um, um, a machine learning or version of machine learning in order to do this sort of continuous uh, experimentation and to do efficient experimentation. That's kind of the key here, as we'll talk about in a bit. The idea of doing this cycle this way is to avoid having to do all possible experiments or all in, in some space. Uh, and so the cycle allows us to try to just do the experiments that are the most informative for building of our model. Um, Adam worked in the space of understanding which genes are coding for which enzymes in, in yeast cells. So a very, very simple, straightforward problem, but there are many genes and many um, enzymes. And so the idea was to learn the correspondence between the genes and the enzymes by, by analyzing knockouts of each gene. Um, and this was uh, quite an accomplishment. However, Adam was a very specialized robot that um, did basically just this one task. And the task was grow a specific strain of yeast, add particular um, uh, molecules that were part of the, the metabolic pathway and see whether the strain of yeast could survive. Um, and the AI side of it was a pre-planned decision tree. For those of you who know what a decision tree is, where ahead of time, um, by examining what all the possible pathways are, which is in here, um, finding what is the, the um, cheapest way to traverse this uh, using a decision tree where you decide at each step whether or not that's the gene um, it, that you're, that, is uh, assigned to that enzyme. If yes, then you move on to the next one. If no, then you do something else. And so it used the decision tree and the answers were yes or no. It either survived or it didn't. And as a result, that specialization meant that it wasn't really adopted by other laboratories. Um, but in the interim years, um, there are two major things that have um, enabled automated science to be more widely adoptable um, and hence this program. One of which is dramatic advances in laboratory automation, much cheaper, much more capable, many more types of instruments, and of course, rapid growth in machine learning and AI. And so um, there are instruments now that can do almost any experimental technique that, that you can do on, on a benchtop. Um, these are just videos of you know, some of those instruments. And so that's obviously very important. And um, there, as we've talked about, are uh, advances in AI. Um, and now what we um, are able to do is to do predictive models, even when we don't know what all the right results are that are, that are um, um, possible. So in the, um, in the yeast experiment, the answer was yes or no. But of course, there are many, many experiments where the answers may, may not be known. If the form of the answers may not even be known in advance. And there are AI methods for doing for, for learning those kinds of models. 
Um, and of course, um, we need AI to evaluate um, which particular data should be collected. And we don't need to, we can't do that with a decision tree because most of the problems we deal with are too big for that. And so we can't consider and advance all possible sequences of experiments. We consider them um, at each, in each round, right? And so with those um, sort of um, characteristics now, it's possible to do much more open-ended types of experiments using readily available uh, laboratory automation equipment. This is a, a study that we, we did in my, gr my group a, a couple of years ago, where we used automated microscopes and an automated liquid handler to study the effects of different drugs on different uh, protein localizations. Um, the, um, whoops, wrong way. The, the, the main point here is that the um, whole thing had to be done by automated Im image analysis where you didn't know in advance what the results are. Um, and there were a lot of experiments to do, but the results ended up being that if you looked at the accuracy of the model versus how many of the possible experiments were done, um, we got a, a result of doing only 28% of the possible experiments and got a model that was 92% accurate. Right. And so that's an example of the reason why we want to do this kind of automation, um, because that, save, that saves money, of course, in, in what experiments we execute. Uh, it saves time. And because the instruments are much more compact than typical laboratories, they, it even saves space. And um, there are also important things, which are automated instruments are typically safer, typically more reproducible. Um, in terms of the, the results that, that, that they get, right? And all of this is necessary in biomedical research because living systems are so much more complicated than most of us ever really imagined. Um, and so um, we need the ability to study very large experimental spaces in order to be able um, to understand by, uh, living systems uh, and hence automated science. So, um, this is clearly what the future of experimental science looks like, at least in biology and probably in chemistry and material science as well. Um, and we have, uh, in, in starting the, the program a couple of years ago, um, we rec recognized that there were a lot of openings that people were looking for, uh, people in this general space. Um, uh, two major players uh, are what are called cloud labs. These are labs that have laboratory automation equipment. And um, then they have um, automated systems that will schedule jobs on that equipment. Uh, and so they actually provide a service to do experiments through the cloud. Um, and they, of course, um, need people to, to work on and, and further develop those systems. And so there are a lot, those are, they're hiring a lot. And then um, pharmaceutical companies, companies, for example, are very much getting into this type of automation. Um, one of the things that our program is, the strong, is very strong in is this issue of fully automated science, not just laboratory automation, not just being able to do things through a cloud, but being able to decide to model and decide what to do. Uh, and of course, this is the first program in the world that does this kind of training, that, that combination, which is again, the robotic side, the, the systems for doing the tasks uh, and the AI machine learning side to be able to build the models and to learn what to do next. And one of the key things that um, we emphasize is being able to do robotics where things are changing, where like we, I mentioned earlier, where you, we don't know what the answers are gonna be in advance so that we're making decisions on the fly and responding to the changing circumstances. Um, uh, you know, an example being self-driving cars. And so we often talk about self-driving instruments in this space because they're analogous to self-driving cars. You, you set a goal for them and then they go off and they, uh, they try to achieve that goal. Um, and the program has courses to provide you with what you need in each of these different domains. Right? We have um, 
an automated lab uh, methods course, which teaches you all about the principles behind these, this laboratory automation, uh, machine learning course, um, and there, there are additional courses on the topic of how to build the models from, um, from the experimental data. And then a course that Chris teaches on um, automating the decision-making behind, um, the, behind the automated science. And the, this is all done in a, an automated uh, laboratory. Josh is gonna tell you more about that, that has many different types of instruments so that one can design different types of experiments uh, as all part of a single workflow or, or different projects. Um, and so just to summarize that part, if you join our program, which we hope you will, um, you will learn all about all of these different things um, and, uh, and as we've talked about, these are things which are very much in demand uh, in the industry. Uh, I should also mention that um, uh, before I hand off to Josh, that uh, the program also has the ability to have early uh, admission into um, our PhD program, either in computational biology or in biology. Uh, and so that for those who are interested in going further, that is also an option. And I'm going to stop there. I'm going to see if there are any um, questions so far. Uh, and so I'll take a second if there are any questions. And then hand off to Josh to talk about the uh, curriculum. So Josh, I can advance the slides for you if you just tell me. OK, uh, we'll go ahead and, and advance some if there are any questions. All right, so I'm going to tell you some details about the curriculum. Uh, so the first part is that we require 174 units of coursework um, compared to a typical university. It's about or other universities, it's three units per credit to give you an idea of what you're looking at there. Um, we have these requirements for the uh, specific grades, you know, B or above on, on average. So GPA of 3.0 and um, we can't count anything less than a C. It's just pretty uh, reasonable. And then you have to be registered full time for all the semesters. So it's not a, a program that you could do uh, part time in any meaningful way. All right, next slide. Uh, so we have two different tracks. We have the professional track and the research track. Uh, basically, we will talk to you about which track you want to go down and then uh, advise you on how you will plan your coursework according to those tracks. So if you go down the professional track, uh, that's designed such that you'll be prepared to go into um, industry immediately after you graduate. And then the research track is designed for students who are interested in pursuing a PhD uh, after graduating. And what is nice about this for our program is the early admission process that uh, Dr. Murphy was just talking about. Um, basically, if you're on the research track, uh, and in the in our program, you can apply to one of two uh, PhD programs uh, here in an early admission. So you would submit your application by September 1st and then get a decision by October 1st. Um, what's great about this from our perspective is that, and from your perspective it should be, is that um, that allows us to modify your uh, curriculum to basically put you ahead of your peers in, in whatever program in either program that you're accepted into. So you can knock out some requirements early and take more advanced classes whenever you're, you're in the PhD studies. So that's, that I think is a, a really nice plus for, for the program. Okay, next slide. As far as the specific courses here, um, so we start out, this is the uh, order of the courses based on um, a student coming in with uh, limited experience in any of the major areas. So we have a programming course, uh, which is a very rigorous but high quality course to uh, get you up to speed on the kind of programming you need for um, the courses that follow. And then for the first year, there's a two semester cycle of laboratory uh, methods courses. Then uh, we also have a, a bio course in the first semester and a, a math course and then professional issues, which is um, a course designed to prepare you for finding internships and finding positions and interviews and that sort of thing. 
Um, then in the second semester, we have the automation of scientific research, which is the AI course where you're, you're learning about how to select the next set of experiments in a closed loop experimental process. Um, then we have machine learning for scientists, which is going to teach you the machine learning methods that you need to um, analyze data and make predictions. And then we have a comp bio seminar, which is giving you uh, an opportunity to see uh, talks from guests from across the world um, talking about modern research. And then we have a, a second professional issues course. Um, next slide. Then in the the second year, we have um, a, a modeling and simulation course and bioinformatics. And basically, those teach you the important skills you need there. And then we have a capstone project course, which is required. The capstone project one is required for um, students, regardless of what track you're on. And then uh, you have options in terms of whether you take a comp bio elective or a uh, basically a research course where you're doing research with a uh, comp bio lab. Then in the final semester, we have a, another CBD course, which is the proteogenomics and metabolomics course and genomics. And then if you're on the professional track, you would take the uh, second capstone course in practice so far. Um, what that's been is an extension of the the project that was started in Capstone One. If you're on the research track, you can switch uh, to do uh, research instead of taking the second Capstone. And then if you want, you have an optional free elective in the, the final semester. Okay, thanks. Josh, before you go on, let me just emphasize that the four courses on the top of this table are to enable you to be able to um, build cutting edge models from very different types of biological data that you, that you would acquire through automation. So that's, since this is a, uh, a closed loop type approach, we have to have high quality models from the data that's being collected. And that's what those four courses are doing. And those four courses um, overlap with um, training that um, PhD and master's students are getting, you know, specifically in uh, a computational biology. Right, so back to you, Josh. Okay. So we have uh, three courses that students can test out of. And the idea here is that we know that you guys would all be coming to us with various levels of experience in um, you know, computational work or in uh, biological background. And so if you have a lot of experience with these, you can test out. And that's either by taking an exam or by completing a project. And the exam and the project time is uh, you will send information early in the summer, and then you'll complete those and submit them. And then uh, by the fall, we'll, we'll know whether you pass the exam, and then we'll make adjustments to your schedule and, and talk to you about those adjustments uh, based on what you have tested out of. Um, next slide. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, automation lab itself. So the automation lab is unique in the world in that it's uh, specifically designed for primarily for teaching students about how to use automation. Um, you'll have lots of opportunities to use it. Uh, so you have the first year, we have two courses, uh, two laboratory methods courses. And then you have the, the two capstones and both of the capstones, depending on the project, may or may not use the, um, use the automation lab. And then if you do MS research with the lab, then that could potentially be done on the robot as well. So you'll have plenty of opportunities to use this pretty slick system. Um, so what I'm showing here is just a, a video we took of the robot doing uh, some work. And you can see different views and different angles for uh, the interior of the, the system. All right, next slide. Yeah, so we have set this system up to be totally remotely accessible. Um, so when, when we first started the program, I'll, I'll admit that my, my plans for uh, remote access were pretty limited. 
but with the pandemic, those got pushed all the way to the beginning. Uh, you know, so those were high priority. So we've spent a lot of effort in basically the last almost year now, um, getting this system such that you can access it from uh, home and you can literally run experiments from your couch if you would like. Um, hopefully in the fall, we'll, we'll be back in person again. Um, but that's just a, a nice advantage of this system, which allows you to be able to work remotely, whether or not that's a requirement based on the, the state of the pandemic. And we have um, multiple angles that you can access, and then we can customize the specific angles that are shown to you uh, by moving the cameras around and that sort of thing. All right, next slide. All right, so the, the capstone projects, um, these I think are a really key part of the program. Uh, basically these projects involve working with industry partners and we define a, a project that you'll work on with them and you'll have the opportunity to, to work with industry professionals. Um, so we, this semester we've had uh, four, or this past semester we had four capstone projects with these four companies. And I'll just tell you a little bit about them. So for the Thermo Fisher project, um, they were interested in uh, learning about how to run robots remotely effectively in the context of a pandemic. And so the specific task the students were working on was to duplicate a specific experimental result from a, a nature paper, but also you know, think about the, the challenges that they faced working remotely versus in person and then proposing ways of addressing those. Uh, Emerald Cloud Lab, that project was uh, designed to uh, test the reproducibility of uh, one or two recent papers and basically also allow them to, to test some uh, hardware in their system. Um, the Asimov project, um, so the, the Asimov company basically produces plasmids. That's, that's their product. And one of the things they need to do is to um, assess the quality of the plasmids that they generate. And so the students were working on a next gen sequencing project to actually determine that the plasmids that they designed are actually the plasmids they're producing. Um, then for the Biocero project, uh, they were interested in anomaly detection. So when you're running a robot or, or an automated system, there are often going to be issues and you need to be able to detect those issues and make intelligent choices about how you manage those problems. And so that's what uh, that project was focused on. And then, as I said before, the projects are uh, one or two semesters for you, depending upon which track you're on. And um, I think this is this is pretty great. So, go on to the next slide. And, and just to note, note that the projects change from year to year, you know, depending right. on what what the companies are interested in. Okay, um, you have some elective options. So in the fourth semester, if you would like to, you may take a free elective. And and then also if you place out of courses in, in the first semester, then you'll have an opportunity for um, additional electives. Next slide. Um, these are the details for those specific electives and the situations in which you could get them. But basically, if you, um, test out our programming, you'll take a algorithms and advanced data structures class or bioinformatics. And then um, if you take bioinformatics, then you'll take another CBD elective later on in the third or fourth semester. If you test out of the bio course, you'll either take a bio course or an advanced comp bio elective. And then if you test out of the uh, machine learning course, you can either take a comp bio elective or a more advanced machine learning course. Uh, but by taking these electives, it doesn't change anything about the uh, unit requirements. It's still 174. Okay. Um, one of the common questions we get is about um, research opportunities and summer internships. So you may absolutely uh, do research assistantships with faculty um, here. And that can happen throughout the year or even over the summer. And when it's uh, during the academic year, 
if you would like, you could um, work for credit as opposed to for pay. And we'll provide you with uh, talks for the faculty so you can uh, watch those and see if you're interested in what they're working on. And then if you are, then contact the faculty about uh, possible positions if you would like. Um, next slide. Sorry, one, sorry, we'll go back for one second. Um, one other note about this is that we would encourage you to um, look at the, the research opportunities for you, but in your, your first semester, you may not want to directly jump into research. Um, make sure that we smoothly transition from the work you're previously doing to um, in the level of work that we, and the challenge that we're gonna provide you in the courses. So if, if that all goes well, then by all means in the second semester, that's when we would suggest starting um, actively researching. But that doesn't prevent you from talking to faculty about research as early as you'd like. And there have okay, been next slide. students who have started in the first semester, um, yes. especially if they you know placed out of something and felt that they were in a good position to do so. Yep. All right. Internships. Um, so we we definitely encourage you to do internships, particularly if you're interested in the uh, professional track. And um, that would be over the summer. And you can take three units, you can get three units of credit for doing an internship if you'd like, and it's tuition free. So that's, that's great. Um, we, we take some efforts to uh, help you find internships. So as part of the professional issues course, you're gonna design a resume or improve an existing resume. And we'll put together a um, resume book and distribute it to people that in the industry that we know are looking for interns. Um, but you, if you're interested in an internship, you can also search for positions on your own. And so in the professional issues class, we'll also teach you about how to do that and how to prepare for um, interviews as well. Yeah, next slide. So this is um, a little bit of organization of the program. So Dr. Murphy and Dr. Langmead are the uh, co-directors of the program. And I am the academic advisor. And Janet is our program coordinator. And then we have uh, the external advisory board members are, are shown here at the bottom. Yeah, next slide. And then a quick note about Pittsburgh. Um, so personally, I, I finished my PhD here in 2013. When I moved to Pittsburgh, my expectation was that um, I would graduate or my, finish my PhD and then leave. And I'm still here. Um, so I, I really like the city. I think there's lots of great things to do. Um, yeah, on the, the top right here, we have a picture of students tubing so when we're not experiencing a pandemic we take the students tubing every year and that's a uh, snow tubing that's a great time um, there are lots of great museums zoos there um, are lots of cool parks if you're into sports we have uh, depending upon how you look at things two or three good teams and uh, but they're they're fun to watch and I think it's, it's generally a great city great place to live and uh, we'll recommend it from that perspective, as well as the high quality education we're going to give you. All right. So any, any questions? <laughs>